Hi everyone, my name is Uwe. I'm the founder of uh, the Guild uh, and today I'll talk to you about uh, GraphQL in general and if it's a good idea to put and use it between uh, services. Um, so a bit about the Guild and myself, we're a group of open source developers, uh, probably the largest group of open source in the GraphQL ecosystem. Uh, we build a lot of um, popular tools like the GraphQL code generator, uh, GraphQL modules, which if you're building a large-scale GraphQL server between different teams, it's a really good solution for that. Or GraphQL Inspector, which basically helps you run GraphQL in production, make sure you're not doing development, not doing breaking changes, uh, validates the production logs and making sure that everything is uh, fine. Um, and we're doing, we're making a lot, we're building a lot of tools in the ecosystem, as you can see. Um, and the, the, the reason we build all those tools is because we think GraphQL helps kind of reimagine uh, how we look at data flows across uh, the stack. Um, and what we want is for you to be able to gradually adopt those open source tools instead of, but at the end, you can integrate them all into one single platform. Um, so let's go back a bit and just give a short intro about GraphQL. So GraphQL is a query language on top of a schema and the schema can describe data and the data can be any data. So it can be a data from a database or from a file or from an API. Um, and the power of that uh, query language is that you can ask for just the things that you need and you get a predictable result. So that result looks exactly like you want it to look and you get just the things that you look in the shape that you want them to be. So it saves a lot of work for you. Let's see an example. So if I'm describing a schema, let's say a schema of a user in a message, then a client can then ask, I want the user's ID and they, from the user I want just the name. So they will send one request to the GraphQL engine. The GraphQL engine will bring the user, extract the name from that user in whatever way uh, we need to, and then we'll get in a single response a predictable result that looks like exactly like we expect with the types that we expect. But if we need something more deep, like for example the user's name in messages, then again we will send one single response, uh, one single request, um, then in parallel fetch the name and the messages, that's GraphQL is doing for us. Um, and then let's say for each message we want the content and the content maybe comes from a third party API or a WordPress or something like that. Um, the client doesn't care and the client will just re get back one predictable results with one and one response. Um, so as you can see, it's very powerful and there's many reasons why it kind of took over the fronted communication in recent years. Um, but let's look a bit about how it works uh, inside because this is an important point when we move to services. So by describing this, we basically, by describing the schema, we describe uh, the schema and the resolvers. Resolvers are basically very simple functions that um, they get an input, they do some work, let's say call a server, and return a predictable output. So we need to write those simple resolvers. But then what the GraphQL engine does itself, everything in that slide is basically happening automatic, automatically for you, is that when the GraphQL engine gets uh, a, a query, it will basically take the first resolver, run it, and based on that result, and the query, it will bring the other execution boxes that it needs to be run and will execute them in parallel. Uh, then it will take the results, uh, put them back in the right place. But for messages, for example, we get an array of three, me three messages. So then, again, the execution engine will automatically, for each message, will run the date and the title because that's what we asked it in the query and we'll get the full result. So this is something that usually we do manually, whether on the front end or the back end, usually on the front end. And GraphQL is basically automating that work for us. So overall, what we saw is that, you know, GraphQL helps us between the client and the server, and it's more performant, and it saves us, saves us a lot of work and a lot of code on the client. Um, but what's, what about the server? I mean, 
you know, what about this area? Like basically we put the GraphQL, one of the powerful things about GraphQL is that we can put it over any existing infrastructure, which is great, but that means that, what if, did we neglect the area in the back? And now that we're, let's say we're happy GraphQL users in our company, uh, our product and our, our products and our front ends are using GraphQL, they're happy. We, what we see a lot in companies is they're the main, the next thing that they want to do is actually to integrate that uh, into the backends. And there's good reasons why people want that, right? Because, um, uh, you know, we want the query language, we want the type safety and things like that. Now, uh, we can actually, there's a few ways of doing that. Uh, and, and while showing you how it's possible, I'll also ask if it's actually a good idea. So one thing to do is that we can actually um, we can actually start and work on the existing backend services and start implementing GraphQL in them. So we can go to existing Java servers or .NET servers or whatever uh, we have and start integrating GraphQL there. Another option is to actually build like small middlewares or small gateways for each service that convert what they're doing manually into GraphQL, which it's fine, it's possible, and there's a lot of companies that advocate for that. The thing is that there's some issues with that. First thing is that um, those are existing services, like we're not coming from void, usually. So, uh, and those teams have their own knowledge and they have also their own um, feature set that they need to implement in their own work. You can't stop everything and just like learn new a new protocol and start exposing and converting your systems. Um, it can take years, if at all possible. The other problem is that the reason I showed you how GraphQL works internally is that you saw, yeah, it automates a lot of work, but it's also, it's still an execution. And the question is, do we want that execution to actually run uh, on the server? So what I mean by that is, um, Let's look a bit about the backend right now. So between the client and the front end, uh, between the client and the GraphQL, um, it, it's valuable for the GraphQL to basically do most of the work and send very thin responses to the client because we have a mobile network in between and the client maybe is very thin client and we want to get as little job or little work as possible on the client. But between service and service maybe, we don't want that. We want actually the service, the services to be predictable, to always return the same result. And maybe we want that work of taking what we want and um, orchestrating and waiting for all those uh, calls. We want that to be happening actually on the consumer service. Um, but maybe we still want, even if we want that to happen, and maybe it's maybe not such a good idea to just boot GraphQL as is on our server services, uh, in some cases, maybe we still want to get the stuff that we wanted from GraphQL, which is this type schema and the query language and the engine. We want to automate that work, even though the consumer will run that work. So, when we we usually work with enterprise clients and like with enterprise companies and they have a lot of existing infrastructure and a lot of services are already having uh, their own protocols and their own work like maybe it's uh, open api and swagger maybe grpc um, so what we thought was can we take the um, the existing schemas and the existing protocols uh, and maybe if they don't have existing schemas and protocols, because some APIs are just, they don't have it, maybe you can use just the docs, or maybe even in that, even if they don't have the docs, then just the live data that we have, because those services are running in existing already. And can we do something, um, can we do something in actually to generate from that what we actually want? So can we take those let's say gRPC services that exist or SOAP services that exist, generate from them and from whatever we currently know a GraphQL schema. And maybe in the second phase, if we take all those schemas and merge them into one graph, into one GraphQL schema. And again, without making them 
doing any change, just relying on the existing technologies that they have. So that's Mesh, that's GraphQL Mesh. Um, so that's the new library that we just released. Um, and the tagline is query anything and run anywhere. So I can query any protocol that I want, any existing service that I want, um, and I can run that execution wherever that I choose to, to run it. So, you know, I can actually take from a, an open API service, I can convert it to GraphQL. I can take a gRPC service and convert, convert that schema into GraphQL. Even an SQL service or a queue service and convert them into GraphQL or GraphQL subscription events. Um, but the thing is, so what we could achieve with that is that we can take the best things that we want from GraphQL using our existing services um, and also executing it where and get all the benefits we want, like the, be the better dev experience that we got from GraphQL. But the execution can be anywhere. And basically what's going on between the wires might still be gRPC or might still be um, uh, REST or SOAP. Um, which may be our better protocols for that or just better protocols for you. So we can just take all those sources, sources, merge them into one, let's say, a central gateway or like a point that, you know, merges all of those into one. But we can also completely distribute it. So every service on the network, whether it's a gateway that needs to aggregate a lot of things, or maybe it's just another service on the network, like let's say, a machine learning service that needs to gather from a lot of different services data all the time, they could have the experience of basically one graph getting all the data from all of the services that they need to, but the execution burden is on them and not on the services themselves, which I think is a the scalable and distributed way of doing it. Um, so let's see an example. So what I have here, this is a very simple example. So what I have here is basically um, two sources uh, that are out of my control. One is a public Swagger, a, a public open API service that holds all the cities in the world and their information. And the other one is the same, uh, is also a public API that holds the weather. Now, with mesh config, just by configuring the source for each one and configuring the handler, in this case it's TypeScript uh, Swagger, but it can be gRPC or SOAP or whatever, just by doing that, I was able to generate a working GraphQL SDK. Let's see it in action. So what I'm doing here is that I'm querying um, find cities uh, using get, which is, as you can see from the name, it's actually uh, a REST endpoint, this open API endpoint. I'm sending it the name of the city that I want, Tel Aviv. And now I can query just the data that I need to get, and I get auto-completion and graphical, like this interface that you see here. I didn't write any single line of code of, in GraphQL, and I get this. And the service didn't change at all. The service doesn't know that I'm doing it. So it doesn't have any burden on it. But I get the, as the consumer, I get exactly the, my dream experience um, that I love always get with GraphQL. But then what we also want is we want to link those two services together. Um, so we have the places API and the weather API, and I can have, they're also because of their schemas and the knowledge that I have, they're fully typed. So I have all the information about them. So I can just in one single resolver show uh, or explain how they, I can convert, let's say, a daily forecast uh, into a city. And now, just by one function and one config, um, what I can do now is suddenly I can have a daily forecast, uh, um, a daily forecast um, field on top of the city's uh, API. So now, for the consumer, it feels like I have one magical GraphQL endpoint that queries everything that I need and the connection between them, a full graph. So it's basically schema stitching on federation, but on any source, um, whether it's GraphQL or not, um, and different sources as well. I can merge SQL source together with uh, SOAP services and get one single graph. 
uh, and again without changing any of the sources. So I, I think this is really a revolutionary thing and you know we're just getting started like we already have since the launch we have like OpenAPI and Swagger, gRPC, SOAP, uh, GraphQL, SQL, OData which querying OData with GraphQL is an extremely powerful experience um, and um, because OData has very similar characteristics but then what we're doing also is we're removing the the debate between GraphQL versus something, GraphQL versus old data or versus something. We basically bring on the tools of GraphQL on any source. Um, and again, like there's a lot of customizations that you would want to have. So, you know, you can, the merging strategies can be very different between stitching and federation. You can turn non-federated services into federated services. Uh, and you can do all kinds of transformation. You can cache um, each source. You can mock each, each source. You can rename the sources. So basically the output API that you get is exactly what you want. Now, the, if we take it one step further, so until now, this, is, this was great for us when we work with companies and it's, it's an extremely powerful library. But then we thought, well, maybe we can take it one step further. Like everything I showed you here, I can actually expose it as a public open source or not open source module. Like for example, throughout my company. Once I did that connection, I can now share it with everyone. So let's say I have a weather API and I have a bank API. First of all, I can now create for my bank API, I can create GraphQL API without them knowing it at all. So now they have GraphQL API, which is amazing. Uh, and they didn't need to do any infrastructure work or nothing like that. But then I can also uh, build a connection. So I can create an API, a GraphQL API for my bank, which with the weather API, which means that I can, let's say, query my all the branches of the bank and the daily forecast in, in the next day in those branches. And again, this is without the bank actually knowing about it. Um, and it's completely distributed. So if we take this one step further, we can we actually start to see that this is one of the, I would say, the most pragmatical um, approaches to go into the what everyone called the semantic web or the web web 3.0. We can start having um, data modules, data module graphs inside our, our uh, company or as an open source, um, and we can start building this. Uh, huge data graph inside our company's community or inside the open community. Um, and I think this is extremely powerful because, again, the only way for this to work is because it's distributed um, and because um, uh, it, it can run anywhere. And there's no, if it's in your company, you can have control of it. But if, but if it's open source, anyone can implement their things and add things to it and we can get actually get to uh, a community driven public module or public data graph um, so that's basically graphical uh, mesh so it can really be helpful um, on your um, inside your service mesh or inside your backend services but you can also start using modules, existing modules, to integrate with all your third-party APIs. So if this was interesting for you, um, uh, you can go to graphicalmesh.com uh, or talk to us. The guild community, as you saw, is like, you know, the probably the, the strongest community um, in the GraphQL ecosystem. Um, and yeah, and talk to us directly. We have forums, we have our GitHub libraries and um, just join the conversation and tell us your use case and how you can use it. Um, thank you very much.